Morning, y'all, and happy Easter. Uh, at least it will be Easter morning by the time most of you see this. I'm recording this on Saturday night uh, because we kind of broke the internet last week. Uh, most too, So many churches uploading services, which is an awesome problem to have, uh, but it took a while to get things uploaded. So I want to get this posted uh, Saturday night so that it'll be ready for you Sunday morning and people aren't waiting for it. And a lot of you may not be waiting for it. I know we don't normally do Sunday school on Easter Sunday morning, so many of you may not have been expecting this. But I looked at the lesson we've got, and while I could look at it and say, well, it's, it's, it's a common passage, it's kind of a canned, hey, the resurrection's real, let's move on sort of a lesson. Um, I, as I thought about it a little bit more, I realized there's some stuff here that is really, um, I hesitate to even say worth talking about. It's always worth talking about the resurrection, of course. But there's some points that the author brings out that I think are really relevant to where we are right now in this country and as a church. And so I, I thought it was uh, worth our time to spend a little bit on that uh, this Easter. So our passage is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8. And before I get into the text, I want to start with the author's introduction because he brings out a point that I want to spend just a minute on. He says, uh, but do we embrace the resurrection as an actual historical event or simply regard it as spiritual folklore? Many favor the latter view. Now, we as a church, as Baptists, as Southern Baptists, uh, as Orthodox Christians, as Evangelicals, we believe that the resurrection is a historical fact. Uh, that has been the Orthodox view of the church since the resurrection. Uh, Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Presbyterians mostly, Pentecostals, uh, most of the church considers the resurrection a historic fact. And we would expect people like agnostics and atheists and other skeptics to say that, well, this is all mythology, right? Jesus never lived, that, those sorts of things. But did you know that there are people who say there are Christians who are in churches, who are pastors, who don't say that the resurrection is a fact? I brought this up to you uh, some months ago, I guess, on a Wednesday night, if I remember correctly. But it's worth bringing up again here. This is an article, and I'm going to see if how well this works. I think it will. This is an article out of the New York Times. Uh, you can see the date on it is April 20th, 2019. So this was around last Easter. Uh, and this is a guy that does these articles periodically, uh, typically at Christmas and Easter. He's interviewing Serene Jones, who he says here is a Protestant minister. She's actually ordained in two different denominations. And she's president of Union Theological Seminary, which is a rather large seminary in New York City. And so he says, Happy Easter, Reverend Jones. To start, do you think of Easter as a literal flesh and blood resurrection? I have problems with that. Seems like a reasonable question to, uh, to ask and, and for a reporter to expect an answer for. He's asking her to defend the faith, and that's okay. Here's what she says. When you look in the Gospels, the stories are all over the place. There's no resurrection and story in Mark, just an empty tomb. Now, I'm going to stop there for a second. The reason she says that, and our author alludes to it a little later on, many believe that Mark was the first gospel written and that Matthew and Luke uh, had read Mark when they started writing. So Mark would be the earliest account is, is the assumption she's making when she says this. And she says there's no resurrection story in Mark, just an empty tomb. Those who claim to know whether or not it happened are kidding themselves. In other words, what she's saying is Mark says there's an empty tomb and then Matthew and Luke made up the resurrection story, probably. But that empty tomb symbolizes the ultimate love in our lives that cannot be crucified and killed. For me, it's impossible to tell the story of Easter without also telling the story of the cross. The crucifixion is a first century lynching. It couldn't be more pertinent to our world today. He says, but without a physical resurrection, isn't there a risk we're left with just the crucifixion? And she says... Crucifixion is not something God is orchestrating from upstairs. The pervasive idea of an abusive Godfather who sends his own kid to the cross so God for, could forgive people is nuts. For me, the cross is an enactment of our human hatred. But what happens on Easter is the triumph of love in the midst of suffering. Isn't that a reason for hope? I'm going to skip this just a little bit. Down to here. For me... The message of Easter is that love is stronger than life or death. There's a much more awesome claim than that they put Jesus in the tomb and three days later he wasn't there, which is what she says Mark is telling us. And everything after that is made up. 
For Christians for whom the physical resurrection becomes a sort of obsession, that she would say that about you and me, that seems to be a pretty wobbly faith. What if tomorrow someone found the body of Jesus still in the tomb? Would that then mean Christianity was a lie? No, faith is stronger than that. Let that sink in for just a minute. Christianity is stronger than the truth of the resurrection. Paul differs. And my point here is that it's not just people who don't believe Jesus existed that say these things. It's not just the occasional skeptic. There are people preaching, teaching in seminary to teach other preachers, people who call themselves Christians that deny the truth of the resurrection. And yet that's the foundation of our faith. So that foundation is worth talking about, and I can't think of a more appropriate time to talk about it than Easter. So let's, let's look into it. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 3. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. <clears throat> so, Paul starts with, I'm re going to repeat for you. I declare unto you the gospel that I already preached. This is what I preached. I'm going to summarize it. I've already preached it, and you received it, and you believed it. And if you don't believe it anymore, you believe your belief was a waste of time. We know that faith that does not endure the end isn't a saving faith, right? He who endures to the end will be saved. If it's true faith, it endures to the end, right? So Paul's saying, if, if you don't believe this anymore, you've wasted your time all along anyway, right? This is the gospel. You believed this once. I don't know why there's a problem now. So he, what he's really trying to do is start on common ground. He's, he's kind of a, a devil's advocate argument. Look, you, you believed this before, right? You still believe it now, right? Okay, good. Then we're on the same page. Let's start from the same starting point, and then I'm going to make my argument. Because the context is, they denied that we will be raised. There was some arguing about that. And so he's starting with, Christ was raised, and then he'll take the argument from there. So, the first point he makes here is, that I delivered unto you what I received, okay? How Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now, that's the first point. Christ can't be raised from the dead if he didn't die. And there are those that make the argument that he actually did not die. Some say he just swooned, he fainted, and they carried him off. Uh, the Muslims claim he was never actually crucified. Someone else was crucified in his place. But the bottom line is, all the testimony that we have is that he actually died. Okay, for um, First off, let's look at where it, what the author brings up here as far as evidence, because it's worth looking at. Uh, this letter is dated around 55 AD, it's so it's within 25 years of Christ's death. It's also one of the first books of the New Testament written, and it precedes, likely, all of the Gospels. Mark may have been written around the same time, but most people think Mark's a little bit later. So likely, this is the first account, written account that we have of this. Now, it was, it was being told throughout the church, it, it, everyone knows this, but this is the first written account that we have. And it says point blank, he died. There's no ambiguity about it, okay? In order for him to die for a sin, he had to die. In order for there to be a sacrifice for sin, he had to die. And that's his point in saying, according to the scriptures, because the scriptures say that the Messiah had to be wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, right? He, he had to be the sacrifice, God himself would provide the lamb. Isaac was a type, right? And so the sacrifice for sin has to die. There, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. So there's one that according to the law, he had to die. And that, so the scriptures foretold that he was going to die. So he, he definitely died. Then the other that our author here points out is we have lots of evidence outside of the scripture that he actually died. Josephus, who is widely considered to be the best extra-biblical source we have, and one of the best sources in Roman antiquity, actually. Um, and there's several others named there. You can read it for yourself. But the bottom line is, we have better evidence of Jesus' actual life and the fact that he was crucified 
than we have of just about any other fact in ancient history, particularly in the Roman period. We have more witnesses. And Paul here, let me add this in too, we actually have five witnesses because we have four Gospels and here we have Paul. That's five. Okay? And Paul claims to be reporting on multiple witnesses. Luke claims to be reporting from multiple witnesses and summarizing. That is way more evidence than we have of anything else in that period. Period. It just is. I am more confident that Jesus actually was crucified than I am that Julius Caesar lived because there's more evidence for it. It's just that simple. That's as sure as anything can be is in history is what's at the bottom of the page here on page 79, and that's entirely correct. He had to die. So once we're through the fact that he died, because he can't be raised from the dead if he's not dead, right? He didn't faint. He didn't swoon and get buried. He was dead. Okay? Paul goes on in verse 4, and that he was buried, and that he rose the, again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now first he died, and then they buried him, and he was in the ground for three days. Okay? Without water for three days, it's not live. It's not how it works, okay? So, uh, he, he, he was buried, he was very dead, and he was very buried, and he was there. And he was placed under guard there, as we see in the Gospels. There were a bunch of people saw him there. There was no dispute that he was dead and buried, ever. No one has ever contested that until the Muslims came along and, and they contested it, and then the modern time people do. But at the time, there was no argument at all. He died and he was buried, period. And then he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures, because the scriptures say that he was raised. And the author here says we can't overstate the significance of the resurrection and his historical nature. The very foundation of the Christian faith depends and hopes on the resurrection of Jesus. It does. That's what the rest of the chapter, the next section of the chapter talks about is that if Christ isn't raised, our faith is vain. We are still dead in our sins because the sacrifice for sin is not complete. He's still dead. Death hasn't been conquered. Right? If there's no resurrection of the dead, what's the point in any of this? Right? If Christ is still dead, if Christ is still dead, he isn't who he said he was. Right? He's just some guy that was talking a bunch of stuff and he was crucified. It's his resurrection that proves that he's who he said he was. It's critical. If the resurrection didn't occur, there's no Christianity. That's Paul's argument. It proves that he was really a person, that he was buried. He wasn't a demigod. He wasn't an image. He didn't look like he died, but he wasn't really there like the early Gnostics claimed. He was a real person that really died and was really buried. He was really physically there. And then... He defeated death. He's the only one to ever do it. So, if you think about it, I think this is kind of a cool way to put it. You remember Babe Ruth? Remember how he would he, he's uh, told to have walked up to the plate and looked and went and points to the right field fence and then walks up and sure enough, hits a home run exactly where he pointed? He's calling his shots, right? Well, Jesus called his shots. He looked at death and said, three days, bring it and did exactly what he said he was going to do. That's how you know he's who he said he was. He's the only person to have pulled it off, and he called it three days ahead of time. That's pretty impressive. <coughs> Excuse me. If you want to reverse death, you got to overcome it with life. And that's exactly what he did. He resets creation. Resets us back to the beginning, is, is where we find the end, as we talked about, last week. So then Peter goes on, or correction, Paul goes on with the evidence in verse 5, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of about five hundred brethren at once, some of, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, <clears throat> then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time. So Cephas, Cephas, it's Peter, okay? We, we know this from, from context and other usage. 
It's his Aramaic name instead of his Greek name. That's all. So um, everyone agrees there has to be an empty tomb. Okay, there, There's really no way around it. Otherwise, as the apostles all make this claim, Jesus rose from the dead, the chief priest can go, his body's over there. What are you talking about? But if there's an empty tomb, there's no argument. And there was never an argument. There's never a dispute that Jesus was raised from the dead. There's never anybody that says, but his grave's right there. Because it's not. But was there a grave robbery? After all, we see that conspiracy in the Gospels, right? But here's what Paul does. The apostles are mostly still alive at this point. And they're witnesses. James, the brother of Jesus, 500 other people. And Paul says, some of them have died. But many of them, most of them are still with us. If you don't believe me, go ask them. Now here's how we kind of know. If this really dates to 55 AD, as we suspect, there's no way he's lying. Because he's saying, you know these people. You've met the eyewitnesses, right? He's telling the truth. It's what really happened. The book points out that this, this little section here is probably a, uh, an ancient confession of faith, and if, just because of the format it takes. And if that's the case, it probably predates Paul's writing by quite a bit. That Paul's saying, here's the, the, the creed, if you will, that I delivered to you. Sort of like we say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Th those kinds of things. It, he's saying Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture. He was buried, and he rose again on the third day, according to the Scriptures. This, this is the core of the faith. And it may have been just a way that they said that on a regular basis. So, if that's the case, this as a commonly known truth predates that and goes to a time when there were plenty of people around who saw it for themselves. It, it's as close to fact as you're ever going to get anything. On top of that, the disciples had nothing to gain from making this up. Most of them, it cost them their lives. Why would you make up that a guy who was crucified is still alive and we should keep following him? You're risking being crucified. And in fact, some of them were. Yeah, that's, it's not the way you start a movement, really. And yet they did. And the power of the gospel ever since is further evidence that Jesus was telling the truth and the apostles were telling the truth. James is probably a hostile witness. He didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah until he saw him in the resurrection. And then James is a convert. That's his half-brother. He grew up with Jesus. It's even further evidence when you get somebody like that that believes. And then Paul lists himself last because he is the last. He says, one born out of due time. Everyone else saw Jesus on earth before the ascension during that 40 days after the resurrection and before the ascension. And they, they all saw him. He appeared to, to various people as Paul lists. And then Paul says, but way later, he appeared to me. Like I, I wasn't really supposed to be like that. Okay, I, like I was late, like I was, I'm, I'm kind of weird, I'm odd. I'm, I'm late, I'm last, but he appeared to me too. I've talked to Jesus face to face. I know he's alive. I can tell you this personally. So, what's that mean for us? Well, two things I want to point out. One is it gives us hope. That's really the message of the chapter, is that, if Jesus was raised from the dead, how in the world can you say there's not a resurrection of the dead? And in fact, our hope that he's coming back is based on the fact that he's alive. Because if he's dead, he's not coming, right? And our hope of resurrection when he returns is based on the fact that he's raised. The fact that he conquered death and tells us he's going to do it again for us, well, he already proved he can do it, right? That, and Paul says, that's the core of the faith. Without that, there is no Christianity. Without that, why follow Jesus? It doesn't even matter. The second thing it means to us 
is that for people who argue that, well, in our scientific minds, this doesn't make sense. I don't really like the way the accounts are written. Maybe it didn't really happen that way. I think it's more just allegorical and it's all about love. And that's what they don't believe the gospel. And we need to tell them the truth. And we need to understand where the boundaries of the faith lie. And we need to stand boldly and proclaim this gospel because we live in a world that needs to hear it. Because without the hope that believing in a risen Christ brings, there's no hope. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for sending your Son. I thank you for conquering death through his work that you ordained before the foundation of the world. I thank you that we can have hope and that we can have life in him. Lord, help us to remember this daily. Help us to take up our cross daily and follow. And help us to proclaim the truth and the hope and the life that he gives to the lost world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all have a happy Easter day.